Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the School of Visual Arts Masters in Digital Photography program. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Suzanne. Suzanne Stein fell in love with photography in Europe in 2015. As in her own words, she said she loved chasing people with her new iPhone. Upon her return, she bought a real camera and has been getting up close and personal with her subjects in the streets of New York City, LA Skid Row, the underbelly of Paris, and most recently with the migrants in Mexico who are walking thousands of miles in hope of a better life. Suzanne is unapologetically close to her subjects, yet her objective is far removed from providing an opportunity for people to gawk. Rather, she is motivated by the universal problem of how so many of us can turn a blind eye towards homelessness, inequality, and injustice. So please help me to welcome street and documentary photographer Suzanne Stein, whose hard-hitting images confront us with that which many of us opt to overlook. Suzanne? Thank you for that amazing introduction, Katrine, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I, as, as Katrine said, I am a street and documentary photographer, but I feel that my style is kind of a hybrid. I don't categorize myself. I don't like to be categorized in any way. Um, I kind of shoot street. I do documentary. It's reportage. It's artistic. It is whatever I feel like in the moment. Um, I want to explain to you that what you're going to see tonight is a whole lot of pictures. I have so many pictures. I'm constantly photographing. So the way that I wanted to set this up for you was that you would kind of get an idea of who I am as a person. And basically I have a constant mental kaleidoscope all the time. I have a lot of interest, you know, I'm walking on the street. I have a lot of different thoughts. I have um, impulses. I, I often, you know, have difficulty focusing on any one thing. So my pictures really reflect that because I have so many different subjects. You know, I can literally be in Mexico one day and then, the, then a week later I'm in Williamsburg shooting that the Hasidic Jewish population at Keporos. Um, I photograph people on the subway. I photograph older people on the bus. I'm shooting pictures of dogs. I'm taking pictures of addicts who live on the street. I'm taking pictures of old women who are homebound. I have just so many things that I'm doing. And, and this is like every day, like in one day, I could be doing like three different things. I will often have uh, several projects going at one time. So tonight you're going to see some of these images are just street shots. Uh, they're one-offs. Um, they're narrative images, things that I, little parables I find when I'm walking. And then some are also um, projects, like I'm currently working on migrant population in Mexico, which, which is up right now and is up right now as well. Um, you're gonna see some series that work that I have with a transgendered woman named Bethany who lives on the streets here in the city. Um, and with Jeanette, who is the housebound older woman I mentioned a moment ago. And you're just gonna kind of get an idea of what I do as a photographer. You know, I, I make these really fast connections with people. Um, sometimes the connection can last for only a few seconds, as in some of these uh, portraits you're seeing on the street. These just happen. You know, I just walk up to someone and I'm like, hey, can I take your picture? You know, and uh, sometimes they let me and sometimes they don't, you know, but that's kind of what I do. Um, I came to photography relatively late in life. I did not go to school. I'm totally self taught. That has great things about it and bad things about it. Um, not going to school, there's a lot of connections that I haven't made. There's a lot of uh, protocols that I could have learned that might have made things easier for me. But I just sort of chose to do this on my own. Um, I'm very independent. I was a single mother for many years. I, you know, I still am. And we have had a lot of rough times as a family, my son and I. So these difficulties and troublesome life experiences have really sensitized me to other people who are also living chaotic, precarious lives. Um, I often will only see those people. You know, I, I don't really consciously go out and try to tell specific stories. I just happen to be very drawn 
to a certain energy. And, uh, and a lot of that precariousness is part of who I am as a person. You know, I, um, because I came to this late in life, I had absolutely no idea how to use a camera. For a long time, you know, I started photographing on Skid Row and basically within a few months of picking up a camera, I was on Skid Row in Los Angeles. And I didn't even know what the f-stop was. I didn't know what the difference between f5.6 and f8 was. I didn't know what f1.2 did. I had absolutely no idea. And I feel that, um, you know, I definitely have caught up and I, I, I utilize f-stop constantly now when I'm doing creative portraiture. But at the time I was really focused on making an artistic statement and a statement about the people around me. I was utilizing um, compositional techniques that I kind of, had an innate understanding of because I had a background as an artist, but I didn't use um, photographic techniques that you would use in school. I just, I guess in a way, it was almost like folk art. If you're familiar with the art world, uh, you understand that for instance, um, there are people that come into the art world later in life and they're not classically trained and they're often known as folk artists. So I would say that when I started as a photographer, I was a little bit more like a folk artist. Um, I think that for a lot of people and me especially, my photography is really based and predicated on my experiences in life. And the kind of things that I'm really attracted to, I'm attracted to ultra realism. I am a dedicated social realist. I think realism is critically important, especially now because we turn on the news and we're not really sure what's real. Um, depending on what network you watch, you don't know whether what you're being told. And I feel that photography is so important because it allows us to get a grasp. I guess it's not really fair to say on reality because you know my photography and my reality is not the same as someone else's, but it is, possible to come closer to capturing an objective reality with a camera and please excuse the noise in the background um i feel that you know when i think about myself as an image maker i if i were to describe myself i am a zealot you know i'm not just an enthusiastic motivated photographer i am an absolute zealot in my pursuit of creating images I am fanatical, I'm extreme, I'm driven, I'm very exacting, I never rest. And I'm very, very hard on myself. And when I say I never rest, I mean, I don't rest. I work every day through everything. And I feel that, you know, people will say, hey, take it easy, you know, smell the flowers, rest, relax, man, you know? And for me, that's just, I think that in today's world, especially with photography and art in general, you have to work your ass off, you know? sorry to put it that way, you, you have to work really hard because you are competing with a lot of different people. I, I hate to look at it that way as a competition, but you know, you're really, really, really working towards making your own statement as an artist and a human. And I don't think that rest has any, um, I only rest when I, I can't get up anymore. You know, I'm constantly working and I have, I have personal standards that I really want to maintain. Um, so, you know, one of the things I really want to do right now is tell a little story and this, this story is probably gonna seem a little odd uh, as we're moving through these images, but it made a huge impact on me. And it happened on uh, Skid Row when I'd only been a photographer for about a year and a half. And it taught me so much about the impact of my work on other people. And it also taught me that I needed to take, take what I was doing a lot more seriously than I was. So, you know, one day I was buried deep in Skid Row at, at 6th Street and Gladys Avenue. And at the time, this was probably about four and a half years ago, not a lot of people had been photographing down there and certainly not a lot of women. And I was going down there by myself and I was finding very charismatic people to follow in their lives. And I would just, you know, run on instinct. And I was standing on a corner waiting for my subject, whose name was Victoria. Victoria was an amazing human being that I used to photograph down there. And I was doing kind of a photo series about her daily life. And she was off smoking crack and taking a break. Uh, you know, when you're photographing people with drug addiction, they take breaks for drug use. So she was taking a break 
and I'm by myself on the corner and, and it's scary by yourself in Skid Row because um, there's a lot of crazy stuff that goes down. I'm standing on this corner. There's people talking about shooting someone. There's people using drugs. There's people screaming and yelling. There's all kinds of stuff going down. And I found myself surrounded by a group of women who were um, surrounding me because I had a camera. And one woman in particular walked up to me and she asked me if I would take her picture. And I was really immersed in my own world. I was thinking about my images. I was thinking about you know how I was gonna proceed with capturing these really cool shots of Victoria on Skid Row. I was thinking about my safety. I was thinking about myself. I wasn't focused on anyone other than myself. And this woman wanted me to take her picture. And I was like, whatever, I'm just gonna take her picture and just get her out of my face, you know, because I wasn't really sure where she, where she was coming from. So I photographed her a couple of times. And as I photographed her, she began to talk to me about her family and about her life. And, you know, she started to cry and she started to talk to me about how much she missed her parents and how much she missed her mother and father and that they used to take care of her and that they had passed away. And I, I began to realize that I was in a lot deeper than I, I had at first thought. And I, I, I really looked at her then, I really saw her. And I, I realized that she was, you know, intellectually handicapped. And I realized that she was stuck on Skid Row as an intellectually handicapped woman with no one to care for her because her family had passed away and there was nowhere for her to go. So she wound up on Skid Row on the street and she was crying and she started to thank me for taking her picture and for listening to her. And she reached into her bag and she pulled something out and she pressed it into my hand. And she said, I really want you to have this. And I looked into my hand, and I, I couldn't imagine what it was. And I looked down and I saw that she'd handed me a little blue plastic wrapped sanitary napkin. And I thought, I kind of blew the gift off as a really immature childish gift from someone who didn't have a grasp on what kind of a gift to give someone, you know, like a child would give you, you know, a half eaten hot dog or a, or candy wrapper, you know, I, I didn't really understand, you know, why she was giving me this gift. And I said, thank you. She said, you know, I, I really, really want you to have this for when you need it. I really want you to have this. And you know, I, I kind of went on with my day after that and I, I forgot about it. And it wasn't until I, I was driving home, I lived two and a half hours away from Los Angeles at the time in North County, San Diego. I was driving home and it hit me like a brick. And I started literally to cry in the car. And I realized how important the gift was that she gave me because, you know, there's something called hygiene packs. And when women are homeless on the street, outreach workers will give out hygiene packs to women because when women have their periods on the street, um, it's a disaster because there's nowhere to clean up. There's, uh, you know, a dearth of supplies for women, especially if they are mentally handicapped or disabled, uh, developmentally disabled, they, they may not be able to get things that they need. So she had given me a gift that was extremely important to her and I didn't recognize it in the moment. I didn't get in the moment that she gave me something that was really important to her and that she really needed. And she gave it to me because I made her feel important because I took her picture and she wanted to give me something of hers that was equally important to her that would help me out in a pinch. And the tragedy was, is that I didn't understand that in the moment and I didn't give her the thank you that she deserved, which was a big hug and a real thank you. And I never saw her again after that. But that gift really remained with me. And it stays with me now as I tell you this story because it was at that time that I really realized how important what I was doing to many of the people who I was photographing because I was giving them my attention. I was focusing on that person and telling their story. And I learned that I had to really be in the moment with people and I had to really focus on them and not on myself and understand how important it was and what a privilege it was when a, when a human being allows you to photograph them and allows you in, whether it's for a few seconds or it's for you know a year of their life, 
that person is giving you a real gift by allowing you to take a picture. And it was at this time that I really got really serious about what I was doing. And, you know, quite honestly, you know, I really learned that I had to listen more carefully. And I'm still learning that because it's still an issue for me. Sometimes when I'm photographing, I'm very focused on my composition. I'm focused on technique. I'm focused on getting an iconic image. And that is a self-focus as a photographer. That's focusing on my career in a way. But I have really learned that I have to truly focus on the moment that I'm in um, so that I can see everything that I need to see in the picture and exactly what's going on with the person in the picture. And this brings me to using really expensive equipment. You know, I wanted to show you my camera. Let's see. I don't have it with me, but you know, when you're working with people who don't have anything and you're showing up with thousands of dollars worth of equipment, I have developed ways to kind of disguise my equipment. Not part of it is for safety reasons because I don't want to be ripped off because I'm in really crazy spots, you know, um, in really bad neighborhoods sometimes where I'm photographing people that are impulsive and hard to predict. But I've also decided that I don't want people to feel intimidated by my equipment. I, I don't have a lot myself. You know, I am definitely in a precarious life circumstance, you know, financially at times. And so I am very careful with my equipment and I'm very, very uh, selective about pulling it out at times. But I also don't want to intimidate people because I have all this stuff. And I will often walk around with like thousands of dollars. You know, I, I shoot with Sony equipment mostly. I, I also have a Leica camera and I'm very, very fortunate to have this stuff. But um, I recognize that when people see it, it can be very intimidating. And so what I do is I'll duct tape stuff. I, I have duct tape all over my A7R4 right now. I duct tape my um, G Master lenses. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can do to sort of not dumb the equipment down, but to reduce the impact of seeing such expensive equipment because you know, ultimately I need to work with people and have them feel comfortable with me as a person. And so sometimes that means reducing my vanity. You know, I, you know, some of the pictures you're seeing right now, you know, I don't walk into a situation, you know, with my nails done and really great clothes on. I often look like I'm homeless. I've actually been offered money um, because they thought I was homeless. I've been given money while I was on the street because people thought I was on the street, which is a great compliment to me, um, which means that I'm not, I'm creating the impression that I want to create, which is one that is not, too intimidating. Um, you know, when I'm working, when I think about how I work, I really work very much on my instincts. You know, I'm operating purely on instinct and feeling. Um, when I'm walking down the street, I am responding to an intensity that I sense on the street. And a lot of that, as I stated before, is based on my life experiences. And I just seem to have a sixth sense for a, a, a feeling of electricity that I will run into. And it could be part of a scene. You know, you're looking at a picture right here. I'm gonna reference, if you can remember that image of the young man. Um, sometimes there's a, a sense of electricity about a scene that I can't really describe. And it could, it could revolve around a dog, a child, a person, a, a situation. And that electricity can, can last five seconds or five minutes. It can last five years. You know, it could be that I meet someone in that situation and I literally photograph them for years from a chance meeting on the street. Um, and that electricity can leave really very fast. You know, sometimes it happens as a result of deterioration of the person, maybe drugs or mental illness or physical illness causes a, a profound deterioration that alters who they are as a person and reduces their impact and ability to transmit in a picture. Um, you know, years on Skid Row have allowed me to develop my photographic instincts. I think that um, by following my impulses, 
I have a lot of, I guess you would call me an impulsive person in a lot of ways. Um, I photograph people who are incredibly impulsive and instinctual and I myself in a lot of ways am just like them. And so I've learned to hone my instincts by following my impulses. That sounds, it's kind of hard to unravel that, but I think that people can learn certain photographic techniques. You know, photography is more than just understanding how to, how to use a lens, how to use the f-stop, how to use depth of field, how to use lighting. You know, photography is more than technique. Photography is more than the rule of thirds. You know, I don't really know what the rule of thirds is. I, somebody told me about, it, I'm like, oh, I really could care less about the rule of thirds. You know, I make pictures based on what I'm seeing in front of me and uh, my compositions are come from inside me and they're instinctive, you know, but I feel that, um, I feel that as photographers and artists, especially, I think we need to really learn to listen to ourselves, our instincts and our impulses and trust our impulses. Um, because, you know, sometimes I will literally be walking down the street and I, um, in Mexico, I spotted a sex worker on the street and she had these amazing shoes. And I had someone with me who spoke Spanish and she asked the woman, you know, can she take a picture of your shoes? That sounds really weird. You know, who walks up to someone on the street and says, can I photograph your feet? It's weird, you know, but I'm so like, um, innocent about it. I guess there must be something about me. She's like, okay, you know, she let me do it. And um, I photograph dogs. I photograph old ladies. You know, I just get these impulses. It could be red shoes. It could be anything at all. It could be somebody rolling a joint. Um, I just follow whatever it is that I um, feel in the moment. I think that instincts, I think that you can hone these, but I, I've been thinking about whether or not some people as artists have basic instincts that really can't be taught. And I think that although you can learn technique, I think there is no real substitute for being able to follow your instincts and having good instincts. And sometimes we don't develop our instincts until we've lived life a little bit. Um, you know, there are people that are old souls at a young age and have amazing artistic instinct. But for me, it took a long time as a human being to develop uh, in the way that I needed to so that I could be sensitized and also trust myself. Um, you know, I really think it's also a question of self-confidence. You know, I feel that as because I was a single parent and had to be really independent, I've developed a lot of self-confidence. I walk into these situations and sometimes I can't believe my own arrogance. It, really does in a way when you're walking around with the camera and you're aggressively insinuating yourself into people's lives, which is what you're doing as a documentary photographer, as a street photographer, as a storyteller. You know, you have to have a measure of arrogance to even think that you have the right to walk into someone's life and take a picture like some of the ones you're seeing on the screen. And, you know, I'm not using the term arrogance lightly. I'm not saying, I'm not using it in the sense that, you know, you're behaving like a jerk on the street. There are some street photographers who are jerks on the street. I'm not talking about stuffing your camera in someone's face. I'm talking about having a tremendous sense of your own will and, and allowing yourself to develop that because you really need that to go out and put yourself in places and demand that you be allowed access to photograph people in very fragile circumstances. Um, you know, you're looking at some images of Skid Row here and Skid Row is really where I started out as a photographer. And my impulsive nature, you know, married very well with a lot of these people who live their lives based on their instincts and their impulses of people with impulse control disorders. And, you know, I guess maybe I have that too, only I have a camera that I'm pointing at people <laughs> instead of something else. Um, but, you know, working on Skid Row, I um, really began to understand how important it was to photograph reality as it was. I began to reject what I considered to be, you know, a kind of a photographic euphemism, which I see a lot of in print and in publications. 
I see a lot of images that are, you know, euphemistic and they're using benign images to represent a really chaotic, difficult reality. An example of that might be this very stereotypical portrait of the homeless guy in front of a housing shelter or a housing development, you know, a portrait of someone who lives in a housing project and there's just this basic portrait of someone standing there. And that does very little to tell you about what this person faces every day. You know, and sometimes I really believe that this overuse of this type of imagery in media, especially in the United States, it really promotes a general lack of maturity in viewers. Uh, viewers are not used to being shown really raw reality. My work has been called, called raw many times. I don't really see it that way because I guess that's how I am. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I can't be objective, but I think that I have found some difficulty getting my work really seen in the United States. I get published more in Europe and I, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be too judgmental here, but I, I do believe that the use, overuse of euphemism in photography, it really does promote a lack of maturity in, a, in the public because the public is unaccustomed to facing reality. And, and it also promotes apathy because people can't understand what needs to change if they don't see it. And sometimes seeing it means you have to photograph it exactly as you see it without um, relying on, you know, hey, you wanna preserve somebody's dignity. You know, dignity is a very tricky subject. You know, there's a lot of ways to preserve dignity, and but there are times when dignity should not be preserved because you have to tell a story. And, you know, working on Skid Row, you know, for, for example, the, the image on the screen, you know, um, I really learned to shoot really, really fast and to act on pure instinct you know, to be a very instinctive photographer working on wide lenses. Uh, when I started, I was almost exclusively working with a wide lens. And I would say if I only had one lens, it would be my 25 millimeter Battis lens. Um, I shoot wide, sometimes even 21 millimeter if I only have one. Um, I um, feel very strongly that my time on Skid Row has changed me in so many ways as as an artist you know the people that i photographed there we've seen some of the images roll through here um christine a young woman that i photographed shooting up a blonde young blonde woman who suffered horrible physical abuse as a child and who had the terrible misfortune of developing schizophrenia in adolescence which actually is a little unusual people generally develop schizophrenia um, and related disorders in early adulthood, but she developed these, this illness in her adolescence and she was suffering severe physical abuse and she wound up on Skid Row as a, as a sex worker. And, um, you know, Bridget, who was, um, who is a black woman who struggled to stay alive on, on Gladys Avenue and is still there. And she stays alive by recycling garbage. She's one of the hardest working people I have ever known in my life. And I learned a lot from tearing through Skid Row with her by myself, following her while she recycled. We went through all kinds of crazy, crazy circumstances. Um, you know, and uh, that's how I learned to do documentary photography was chasing Bridget through Skid Row. I wanna reference that young man that I had asked you if you, through all this ma massive kaleidoscope of images here, um, I had asked you to sort of try to retain an image of a young man standing in the garbage. That picture stays with me. It stays with me to this day. I, I did that picture a little over a year ago. I was driving in a rented car. I, was, I had an assignment for Los Angeles Magazine and I was headed towards Skid Row and I, I spotted this guy walking with his pants down and he was the dirtiest person I'd ever seen in my life. And I I, I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I knew I had to get out of the car. So I parked and I, I ran after him and wound up following him, him into some very, very dicey areas uh, that were really dangerous for me to be in alone. And 
as I looked at him, I realized that he had deep ligature marks on his wrists, both, both of his arms, he'd been tied. There's, a, there's kind of a, an urban legend about Skid Row that people are held in tents, that they're tied up and held in tents. And it is actually true. I know that for a fact. And I had never seen it. I had seen a little bit. Um, I had witnessed a few things over the years, but I had never actually seen this kind of victimization with my own eyes. And I followed this guy until I got where I thought I could take the picture that would tell the best story that I could of what I was seeing and how it felt and how bereft of everything he was. He had clearly been held somewhere because he'd been tied up for a long period of time and he'd been horribly abused. And after I took the photo that I'm referencing, I had to get the heck out of there because it got really, really dicey for me. I had to leave. Calling 911 was useless because they keep you on hold and the guy disappeared. I never saw him again. And I did look for him, but I never saw him again. Um, on Skid Row, I, um, I feel that I created some of my best images, you know, but I had some really bad things happen to me there that I, that have reduced my ability to shoot there. Um, one thing in particular, I used to shoot, a, shoot images of a woman named Doreen and some of those pictures have already flashed over the screen. Um, I had been photographing her for a few years but she deteriorated so dramatically because of mental illness and drug use for many, many years on the street. She was a sex worker. And what happened was she developed some issues with me that I was not aware of. And when I returned to Skid Row to um, photograph people that I'd been working with for years, um, I ran into her and she set me up. She found out that I was there and she told some people about me and she deliberately walked me past a tent. This sounds crazy. She walked me past a tent where people get trafficked and where people get held. And she alerted them to my presence and they came out and she told them to grab me and I had to run away. And I had no idea what was happening in the moment. I thought they just wanted my camera equipment. I thought I was gonna get ripped off and there's nobody's gonna take my, at the time, my A7R3. Nobody is taking it, they're gonna kill me to get it. And that's what I thought was happening. But what was really happening, I found out from the people on the street was that she was setting me up to sell me. And <laughs> it sounds really crazy. But I was absolutely flabbergasted and terrified. And I, um, it completely changed my ability to even photograph Gladys at, well, the area where this happened. Um, and I had to even stop photographing a person that I had been working with for years because I, I could not go back to that street. Um, so, you know, one of the things I learned on Skid Row, besides how to stay alive, um, it, dignity became something that I, I had to start really thinking about when I was taking pictures of people. You know, where is the line between photographing a life circumstance and a, a truthful reality, you know, and how to preserve someone's self esteem, you know, if they happen to see the image or if their family sees the picture. You know, a lot of the, the women that I photographed on Skid Row were, were super funky and, and they were dignified in their own way. And so I could, you know, take some artistic risks with them and they were cool with that. But there are a lot of other people who are a lot more delicate than that and who are much more fragile. And I had to learn different techniques to photograph people in very trying circumstances you know, places where it's very dirty, very dangerous, you know, because those people had stories to tell, like their life situation was in a way an allegory or a parable or a fable, like an Aesop's fable. I thought of, and I still do think of a lot of the series work that I do as a little fable, as a way to tell a wider story. So how do you do this and not degrade your subject because some of the situations are pretty difficult. So, you know, I think that as a photographer, you're, you know, right now we're looking at multiple exposures. I just wanted to notate that. Um, 
as a photographer, there are lensing techniques that can be used. Uh, there are ways to do a beautiful portrait that is tragic and very raw and realistic and sensitive and beautiful. And for example, you know, you can use a uh, certain portrait lenses that will allow you to capture tragedy and beauty at the same time. Um, you know, using timing and composition. For example, I recently photographed a woman on the street uh, right at Thanksgiving and she had, uh, she was wearing a lot of dark clothing and she was very wizened and very weathered and she was severely mentally ill, but she was also strangely lucid. I had, I started talking to her, she was by herself and it was really a sad situation, but me and my son were shopping for Thanksgiving and we started talking to her and she gave me all these amazing recommendations for art that I should look at and photographers that I should find. And she was really lucid, but at the same time, she had a lot of uh, mannerisms that indicated profound mental illness. So what I did was to photograph her, I had to work really hard to do it. I didn't want to photograph her necessarily as she appeared on the street. I wanted to photograph her so that I could capture the person that she could be or that she was deep inside her. So that required me to use a lot of compositional techniques. Um, I used a 50 millimeter lens. I had to really time the picture really well to capture her expression at a precise instant when that would give me an indication of her character without distracting facial mannerisms that would have viewers instantly dismiss her as just another homeless woman. I wanted to capture an element of her soul. And to do that, um, I had to use a lot of timing, a lot of thought and a lot of uh, lighting. You know, I used light and I, I was able to capture that portrait in a way that spoke of her circumstances without completely creating a grotesque image. Um, one of the things that I do routinely is I do photograph fragility. And it's a, a concept that I've been thinking a lot about. There are different kinds of fragility, you know, um, there are different ways to capture it. The first person that I consider when I think of fragility would be Jeanette. Jeanette is a housebound woman who has lived on uh, Avenue A in the East Village for 47 years. And she is going through a very long and drawn out process of dying. I met her four years ago on the street and we struck up a friendship and I have been photographing her life. And over the last couple of years, she is, I thought she was gonna be dead two years ago. I was convinced. I was doing a, a uh, campaign for Fujifilm for the X100B camera. And I used this camera to, uh, to make a series of images of her. And I was so convinced that she was gonna pass away at any moment that I convinced Fujifilm to let me use their amazing um, medium format 100 megapixel camera because I really thought she was gonna be dead any day and I had to use this camera. And you know what? She is still hanging on, barely hanging on. Um, but in this situation, her fragility is physical and she is so, so handicapped at this point that she's incontinent, she can't get to the bathroom. She's in a social services nightmare where she cannot be removed from the building for legal reasons, but she needs to be removed from the building. Um, it's so bad now, it's, it's a catastrophic living circumstance that happens to you know, a lot of older people in New York City. You know, they become housebound, they can't clean up their apartments, they don't wanna leave their home, they don't wanna leave their life, they can't forego their independence. Um, and there are very few social services that can really get to them if they don't give permission. It's actually a really serious issue. And so what wound up happening with Jeanette is her living environment became so catastrophic that I couldn't even enter. And she was actually removed from the apartment for, for a week um, and held on a psychiatric hold in the hospital. And I had to step in as a human being and do something that I never would have thought I would have done She's had situations with animals in the apartment who have died, animals that have died because of neglect, because of illness, because of different horrible things going on. And 
she had a cat in the apartment that was being severely neglected and it was in a, an absolutely untenable situation. And I uh, organized a rescue. And because I did that, I no longer can be in her life because she's infuriated with me, but I had to rescue this animal because the animal was going to die and I couldn't stand by and witness that. So I lost Jeanette because I saved her cat and the cat now has a wonderful home. <laughs> so, you know, there is one good thing about that. Um, another very strong example that has a lot of meaning to me of photographing fragility is my work with Bethany, who you have seen, you may remember an image of a woman without a shirt on, bare breasted. And, you know, Bethany is a transgendered woman, male to female, and she's living on the streets of New York City. And I began photographing her as well with the X100V. This is not an ad for that camera, but that's when I started doing my work with Bethany. And um, Bethany suffers from severe borderline personality disorder. She is, you know, that's a type of a mental illness. She is a, a, has severe substance abuse and she's also a sociopath. So that is a different kind of fragility. That is an explosive fragility. I've had to take many breaks from Bethany because Bethany is dangerous to be around. She's not necessarily dangerous to me, although there were times when she was. Um, but, you know, just a few days ago, she told me that she beat a woman severely on the street. I'm still photographing Bethany. Um, you know, and that photographing that type of fragility and that type of person brings me to a concept that is a little bit difficult to articulate, but I'm going to try. And that is, how do you photograph a person whose perception of their life circumstances is in direct contradiction to how they appear to the rest of us. So Bethany's perception of herself is as a victim. Bethany's perception of herself is that she is suffering because the world has dumped a load of crap on her head. And I photograph a lot of people like that. How do you photograph a person who feels that way about themselves and sees the world in those terms how do you juxtapose that reality of that person's internal perceptions with the reality of how we all see them? You know, we see a violent individual, we see a drug addict, we see someone who is um, maybe not worth our time to spend time with, you know? So the way that I have learned to do that is I have developed ways of finding images that capture in a poignant manner how the person feels about their life and then juxtapose those images with more objective reads and narratives of how they really appear to others. Because we often can't see, I can't hear myself speak right now. I don't really know how I'm coming across to everyone um, because I'm in my my own personal narrative. And so a lot of times when we're photographing and documenting people in situations, we're documenting two things. We're documenting how the people in the situation feel about their situation. And we're also documenting how the rest of us see it. And those perspectives are very important to keep in mind in documentary photography, because you need to, there are different methods that you can use and that I employ to tell stories whether it's photographing objects, photographing light, photographing a poignant image of someone holding a teddy bear and then photographing a really dirty picture of this person ready to flip out on the street, on the subway. You know, so I'm, it's a, it's an, a visual, I suppose a visual dichotomy, a contradiction. And how do you, how do you even attempt to tell a story that has so many facets and so many points of view? Um, one other situation that I find to be very delicate is when family finds my pictures. I have been contacted by family and they see their loved one's pictures and I'm dealing with their loved one on the street. 
you know, not all of the images I do are so heavy. You know, a lot of them are one-offs. I do a lot of street photos, like the one that's on this picture right screen right now. I love photographing beautiful people that I find, random stuff. But, you know, because I do a lot of serious work with people, I get involved in their lives. You know, I find them on the street. I know a lot about them. Their families find out about me. They contact me recently. Someone that I've been photographing for a few years, a little bit, her grandfather passed away. So I was tasked with finding little bit on the street and conveying to her this information that she needed to call her family because someone died. And there's a lot of delicacy involved there because I can't be super honest with the family about what's really going on. And I can't be really honest with little bit all the way about what's going on. And when you have people on the street, a lot of times, you know, they can't just get up and go see their family. I can't explain this to their family, but they have to get enough drugs to go to the funeral. You know, little bit had to panhandle and boost. Boosting is stealing from stores to get enough money to buy enough drugs to go for two or three days to a family funeral. So I wind up in these situations, you know, over Thanksgiving, I was running around trying to find someone on the street. Um, between making turkey and also fixing pictures and trying to get things published and doing all this stuff. I'm trying to um, navigate an extremely delicate situation in a family that is um, facing tragedy in so many ways, you know, and I think a lot of what I do is, is really subconscious. You know, I don't think consciously, hey, I'm going to go out and focus on people who are invisible. I oftentimes only see those people that are invisible. While I am photographing a beautiful woman in a red dress in Paris, I am also photographing this guy holding flowers who has cancer and who was panhandling one day and someone gave him flowers. That's a little bit. That's the person that I was just talking about whose grandfather died. Um, you know, a lot of times, as I explained earlier, I am photographing based on instinct. And so I almost see the world with a kind of filter. I, I see just these people sometimes. For instance, the guy on screen now was cutting on a Paris Boulevard, on the Boulevard Magenta. And that was a really dicey situation. I just got it into my head. I was gonna get this picture and it was really dangerous for me to do it. And I'm not saying it because I'm so cool. I'm saying it because I do stupid things. I am on working on impulse and I put myself in situations where I, uh, I get hurt. I have had two concussions because of working on the street. I've been kicked in the head and I've been beaten in the head and I have damaged vision in my right eye, which is why I'm wearing these glasses. Besides getting older, I can't see very well out of my right eye. And it's because I am, you know, focusing on a certain aspect of society. Sometimes I love to photograph like these girls um, during gay pride in Paris, but I photograph all different kinds of things. And so it leads me into places where, um, you know, I'm a small person, I'm five, four, and I just sort of dive in, you know, and because these are the people that I see. A lot of times I don't see the regular people. I have no interest in them. I can't really explain it, but I'm gonna say that I feel, and I've said this before, that life is a mosaic. And by mosaic, I mean, there's lots of little colors. And everything is part of the mosaic. Everything is part of the picture. And everything is equal weight. You know, you can say that some people are better than others. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have more to give society than other people do. Some people are, are a drain on all of us. But we all have the same weight. We, on a molecular level, I mean, with a few variations in human body structure, you know, we weigh the same. We mean the same. And we, no matter what, someone's position in society is we all belong in the mosaic. And that sounds really trite, but it's really true. And I find that in street photography, which I have lately begun to reject a little bit. I love street photography. I would always be a street photographer at heart, but I feel that my, my style is, um, as I said, a hybrid. I feel that in street photography currently, there is a lack of depth. Um, I feel that, you know, there's a lot of people in situations that are excluded in awards and in publications that have to do with street photography. 
you know, I took a lot of flack for many years because I photographed homeless people. A lot of street photographers thought I was exploiting, thought I was this, thought I was that. I don't know how you can go out on the street and miss some of these scenes. They're right there in front of you, you know? Um, so I feel that excluding a whole population of people and a whole reality of life, like gritty pictures in Paris. Paris is not just the fabled images of Paris that we see on a postcard. I went to Paris and I photographed life. And I feel that a lot of this stuff gets excluded, you know, and I think it's shameful. I think that in some respects, and I mean no disrespect, but I feel like many times people who are in control of the images that we see in the media and images that gain recognition, not all documentary reportage images, I'm not discussing world press photo here. I'm discussing other types of images, for instance, on Instagram, things that win awards. You know, the people that are in charge of that, their aesthetic is shaped by privilege. And I think that privilege is, is an overused word these days, but it is an important word to understand. Because when you have people who are relatively complacent, who are, you know, in charge of pictures that go into publications, these people, when their aesthetic is shaped by their privilege, you know, and their complacency and their satiety in their life, that excises a whole group of realistic images that we need to see. I mean, I am a social realist photographer, so I'm going to show you pictures of I want you to feel it. You know, I want you to see what I'm seeing. Um, I do find a lot of intense beauty in places that are often deemed to be superficially ugly. I guess I have a reversed sort of aesthetic myself. You know, I, I'm not saying that a guy cutting on the street is beautiful, but this couple that you're seeing is beautiful. That's a little bit of a rough image. Those people are not living on Park Avenue. That is an important picture, you know. Um, the picture up right now, that's a, a really attractive girl. And the one up here is a gorgeous woman. I take pictures like that. I dive right in when I see an image like this, I'm going to go for it. Um, but I do think that it is really important to recognize that we really do need to include everyone, you know, and sometimes I'm finding that there's a lot of generalization that leaves me cold. For example, you're looking at images of Williamsburg. I am Jewish, not a practicing Jew, I'm half Jewish, but I grew up feeling very Jewish because I suffered a lot of anti-Semitism. And so when I go to Williamsburg, it is a very special place. I love it there so much. I was just there today. You know, I shot some pictures and, you know, quite honestly, I've been accused of anti-Semitism by other Semites who think that I'm encouraging anti-Semitism because I take difficult pictures in Williamsburg. And I'm referring to Kaporos, which is a, a chicken slaughtering ritual that people do um, to purify. I'm not gonna get into a whole explanation, but if people are interested, they can go on my website and see my Kaporos gallery. And I feel that Kaporos is a really important custom from a ethnographic point of view. I photograph it because it's, Initially, when I saw it, I was really upset by it. But now, you know, I recognize that we're all killing and eating chickens. So, you know, I went and I photographed that really honestly, and I lost some followers, people that were angry with me because I went in there as a Jewish person and took pictures that weren't flattering. But it's really important to take honest pictures, whether or not it is my, you know, part of my bloodline or not, you know, and I do see other photographers taking what I call dignity pictures of communities that, you know, shouldn't, that need to be photographed much more realistically so we can get an idea of how people are living. It's not about preserving people's dignity or preserving my dignity as a photographer because I'm afraid people will look upon ethnic groups that I love, um, all ethnic groups that I love, you have to be able to be honest and that relies on the maturity of our audience to understand that just because we are taking a picture of a practice in a neighborhood that doesn't mean that all people are just killing chickens or that it means they're bad. Too much of photography now is on social media and social media encourages these generalizations. It encourages us to lack maturity and it encourages us to 
roll past a lot of pictures in a superficial way that we're not really understanding. I love my Instagram following. I am very fortunate to have people that have followed me for a long time and who have stuck with me through a lot of changes. And, you know, I have bounced around and done a lot of different things. Um, but there's a double-edged sword with social media. Social media, there's a lot of importance placed on how many followers you have. I have a following of just over 57,000 people. And it's really hard for me to gain followers because I get censored every now and then. I get pictures pulled down, which messes up my algorithm. We all know the stories about the algorithm on Instagram. And I grew up on Instagram in a way. I was a photographer. I, I started on Instagram. I mean, I, I didn't have a pho photography education. I looked on Instagram. I went to the library, whatever. But, um, you know, while Instagram enables us to show a lot of people our point of view, it also, there's a lot of ways to game that system. And I think we really need to be aware that having a great big following is not all there is to it. Um, you know, I recently reached out to someone because I really needed a little help in getting a recent series of images seen more widely. And I, I didn't know how to do it. And the person told me to grow my following huge, you know, work on my social media and get it huge because my following base is not really that big. And I was really dismayed by that advice because as an artist, the last thing I'm going to do is spend time growing my following because that to me is a waste of time. Um, I would encourage people to focus on their art, study art, go to a museum. You know, this whole thing with social media, you know, a lot of times the images that please a general audience are not images that are necessarily artistically brilliant or have content that is meaningful. And it is really important that we focus on our content, not on how many likes and how many followers that we have. And so I will continue to do that and, you know, despite the fact that it has hurt me in some respects, you know, by focusing on the kinds of images that I make, there are endorsements that I don't get. There are things that don't happen for me career-wise because I have kind of stuck with this way of interpreting the world, but I can't do it any other way. I have occasionally tried to lay off the hard images and I've told myself, you know, no more photographing difficult stuff, go out and do cute stuff, you know, stuff like what you're looking at, which is still kind of gritty, but it's, it's not objectionable. And I realized that, you know, I, I can't just do pictures of people hugging on the street. I can't just, I have to photograph what I photograph. And if it means that I don't get, you know, to be an ambassador for something that that's what it means. I'm going to continue to do what I do. Um, and I'm going to close this off with one last story that I really want to tell because it is the reason why I take pictures. And it is a little bit of a difficult story for me to tell, but I'm gonna tell it to you. And it's about India. And we did see a picture of India in this uh, montage. She was, it was a black and white picture. You may remember, I should have called your attention to it. She was leaning, you could see her reflection. She's a beautiful mixed race woman. And she was leaning and you could see her reflection in the black and white. If we come across it, I'm gonna call your attention to it. Um, the first time I saw India was when I started out on Skid Row. I was driving through. I, I lacked the courage to get out of my car at this point. I had really just started on Skid Row. And I was driving down Fifth Street and I saw this young woman um, wearing only an oversized, dirty, filthy white t-shirt, man's t-shirt. She was nude except for this t-shirt, no shoes. Um, she was aimless and lost and totally disconnected and dissociated from her surroundings. But she was absolutely beautiful. Um, she was slender and, and really delicate and just had an ethereal quality. She was mixed race, as I explained. She was a little bit, you know, Latina, a little bit black, a little bit white. She had a beautiful skin tone. She had a, kind of a natural burnished auburn hair, co hair color, uh, curly hair. You know, and I, I was completely floored by the sight of her because at the time Skid Row was an absolute, it still is a nightmare, but at this time it was like Total Recall, the movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was like the land of the lost. I mean, people were wandering in the stupor, people were screaming, people were vomiting, people were beating each other on the street, people were doing drugs. It was just an absolute hellscape. And here is this young woman wandering down the street totally out of it by herself 
And I couldn't believe that I was watching this, that she was clearly mentally ill and that I was living in a country where we allow mentally ill young women to wander in hell alone. I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was completely floored. So, you know, I, I went about my business. I, I didn't get out of the car at the time, but I kept my eyes open for her. And every time I saw her, I, I made myself go and speak to her. And I found that she was, you know, she's severely mentally ill. She had a very disconnected way of speaking. I believe that she was schizophrenic, a disorganized type. That is a type of schizophrenia where, you know, people express themselves in very fragmented, disorganized manner because they can't organize their speech. And so I had to learn how to listen to her and how to get what was, how to kind of um, extract what she was telling me. And it, it, it took some time of being on Skid Row and learning to speak and listen to people and understand what they were saying. So, you know, the other thing about uh, India was that she had a lot of physical mannerisms, a lot of grotesque facial tics, a lot of twitches, a lot of jerks. And that went along with uh, her mental illness, her mental status, you know? And so I'd run into her and I do pictures with her and she would tell me in her way um, of being hunted by other women on uh, the street, especially on San Julian street and being beaten and mocked because, you know, she was very attractive sometimes. And it really elicited a lot of negative reactions in other women. They would beat her and they would go after her. And especially since she had a lot of twitches and a lot of jerks, it was an excuse to ostracize her and, um, and beat her up. So, you know, once I saw her in this doorway and I photographed her and she had a horrible black eye and she told me that she had been assaulted by a man and uh, she was routinely physically sexually assaulted on the street because she was very vulnerable and very delicate and could not defend herself and was often just really disconnected. And so I photographed her in that doorway and she was so distressed that, you know, she urinated and I wound up standing there, you know, in her urine and that didn't bother me. I would do it again. And I was with her and as I photographed her, she, you know, attracted a lot of negative attention from people, just passerby, regular people just walking past and just, just looking at her because she was clearly distressed, but she wasn't dangerous. She wasn't spewing, vul you know, vulgarities and obscenities. She was just very much um, clearly mentally ill, but attracting so much negative attention that I, I never really understood that, you know, and I photographed her that day and, th and then I had to leave California for a lot of personal reasons. I lost my apartment and I didn't see India for a year. And I returned to Skid Row to continue my project. And I looked for her. It was, I was really hell bent on finding her and I was very lucky to find India. I actually found her really quickly on Fifth and San Pedro, very close to where I first saw her a couple of years before this. And she looked relatively clean and she looked really pretty and she was happy to see me. And I walked with her and she told me in a very disjointed manner that she had recently, within like the last day or two, um, been released from a situation where she was grabbed off the street by a group of men who held her in a building and gang raped her and held her there. And because of her mental illness, it was very hard for me to understand how long she'd been there. People sometimes have difficulty with time and understanding how much time has passed because they're profoundly mentally ill and they don't have executive functioning skills. So they can't tell you enough so that you can get a really accurate sense of the sequential series of events, but that is what happened. So we did some pictures and then she just started drifting away. And, and that happens when you're photographing a, a certain population of people, they disconnect from you. They're with you for a while. They're really, really with you and they're really intent and they're really happy to be with you, but then they begin to disconnect. And once this magic that takes place between you and a person is over, it's over because they disconnect and you have to face that reality. And what happened was she began to drift away and I had to release her. 
you know, and that can be really hard to do, you know, in a way you're giving up possession of someone that you know is going to go away from you and face something awful, you know, but you have to let them go. You know, you have to, they're in your world for only a brief period of time. And then it is time to let them go and you have to release them back into their world, no matter what the consequence is. And so that's what happened that day. And she went away and I was never able to locate her after that. Um, on subsequent trips to Skid Row, I just didn't find her. And I figured, um, I think her picture's coming up here, the picture I described. Um, I was never able to locate her. And I thought, well, you know, maybe she found, you know, a guy, you know, maybe she found someone who's taking care of her. That's India. That is the photo that I took of her in the doorway with a black guy. And uh, her grimace, you know, does camouflage some of her beauty. She was very beautiful. Um, you know, I had it in my mind that she found someone or that she got off Skid Row or that maybe she got housing. You know, I didn't find her. And I just thought, well, you know, maybe she, she found a life somewhere. You know, I wasn't finding her. And I, I imagined that she was somewhere. Um, so what happened was I received an email from a woman who saw my work in Los Angeles Magazine. They actually saw India, it was a family member. And they contacted me to let me know that they were India's family and that they wanted to know if I'd seen India. And I said, no, I, I haven't seen her. You know, And they said, well, we haven't seen her in almost two years. They reported her missing about two months after I photographed her last, after she told me about her attack in the building. They reported her missing shortly after I photographed her. And she had been missing for almost two years during the entire time that I had thought that she was okay, she'd been gone. And I realized that somebody probably grabbed her and somebody who saw that she was defenseless, they grabbed her and something bad happened to India. And that nobody really knows what happened to India. And there might be somebody on Skid Row that knows, there usually is somebody that has an idea, but they never talk and you'll never find out. And it was at that time that her family informed me that she had a six-year-old son and they sent me pictures of her son and I got to see India's son and her son is so beautiful, looks just like her. And um, her son is very well loved. They treasure her son and they take care of him and India's gone. And so that story is why I take pictures because I wanna be able to tell these stories with my pictures. So I'm open to questions. That's the end. Oh, well, Suzanne, um, that was amazing. I think I've got a notebook uh, scribbled with beautiful terms and words and things to think about. Um, you've given us so much to think about, um, you know, from the, I think the very positive, the how you address the people as being part of a mosaic, which is just really beautiful that we're all in this world together to the fragility of what you're seeing. And then I mean, I've, I've followed you and I know you work to the point of exhaustion. I mean, and that's, but yeah. you're talking to art students, you got to work your ass off. Yeah. So, so it, it <laughs> yeah. was all very balanced. Um, we do have a few questions. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll start with some of the process questions because they're always, you know, people want to know. Um, you talked about that you use the, the 21 and the 25 millimeter lens that helps give you that more exaggerated point of view. Um, so Andrew was wondering if some of your portraits, are they, uh, candids or are they, do you set some of them up? How do you, how does that work? You know, for portraits, um, I don't, you know, I, I use a lot of different lenses for portraits. And so I find people who have these crazy moments and they give me these crazy moments and you just have to be really sharp and find people that give you these moments. You know, a lot of the stuff you can't set up. You, yeah. you can't like little, like uh, there was an image of a young girl with a, a, that was little bit whose grandfather died with a lollipop. She had the lollipop. It was midnight on 34th street. I had my 135 G master and I was into it, this G master. Okay. So I like did a G master portrait, you know, so you can't set this stuff up because the kind of people I'm working with, you know, they're just doing all this crazy stuff. A lot of that is, is how you uh, select your subject 
your lensing, uh, and your sense of timing. They do things. I love people that do crazy things. I'm not photographing the woman standing in line, you know, deadpan. I'm photographing people that are very impulsive, that are really like very emotive. And so, um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, just a real quick aside in terms of timing. Um, are you shooting in burst mode or is it like you're concentrating on a specific I moment? I never use burst mode. I'm trying to think, did I ever use burst mode? You had one picture that I used burst mode. It was a guy that I did a long, long time ago with my X-T1. Um, he was jumping over a group of people in Venice right. Beach. I never <laughs> use burst mode. No. Yep. And then I can't time it. I, right. I am very exquisite with my timing. Yep. Really evil about it. And we can say that that photo is your, your sports photo. Yeah, that's my sports photo. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's going to come up. I knew it would come up. Um, have you, have you ever paid people once you've taken their picture? Well, you know, the deal is that when you're walking around the street, you know, you have money sometimes, sometimes I have money and sometimes I don't, yeah. I will, um, buy people food. I'll buy people drinks. When I first started, they would say, Hey, you know, give me $5. I'd be like, okay. You know, when I first started. And then I was like, you know what? I really can't do this because first of all, I can't be pulling cash out. And secondly, they want more. There's a lot of issues that happen, but there are people that I have photographed that aren't asking for money. They don't ask you for anything. A lot of the people that you saw in this deal, they don't ask for anything. They just want to be in the picture. They like the attention. Um, I will give people money that I really think need it. And a lot of times I, I don't do it often because I don't have much money. I am running, I don't know if I made that clear, but I am not a whole lot of steps away from some of the people I photograph. So I don't have a lot of money to give people. I focus on projects and equipment. That's all I can focus on. But you know, when you're walking down the street, man, there's somebody sitting there and, and he's mentally ill and he, he, he has no executive functioning skills. He needs something to eat. Get him something to eat. Give him $10. He knows enough to go and buy himself lunch. Yeah. You know, so there are times when we should be donating, you know, but you have to be really careful with giving people money because the thing is, is, you know, for example, Bethany, I will buy Bethany something to eat. But if I give Bethany money and she shoots up with it and dies, you know. Yep, I understand. Um, and going back to that idea of I'm asking permission, um, uh, Stevens are asking, are you asking permission to photograph religious Jews or are your photos candid? He's heard that Hasidic Jews are very resistant to being photographed. Um, they are, but when I'm there, they don't have a choice. Um, I love them. <laughs> okay. But I cannot ask permission in, in Williamsburg. That is pure street photography. That is ethnographic. I've been, it's been termed ethnographic photography. I don't know what it is, whether it is or it isn't, but you cannot ask permission on the street in general. I don't ask permission for street shots. I just do it. And in Williamsburg, I don't ask permission. Um, during Kiporos, when people were holding chickens, there were times when I, if somebody would have a chicken and I have to ask permission um, to get up close and get that chicken picture. I have some very bloody chicken pictures that of course I, I mostly do not ask permission for, I just do it. You know, um, people are resistant to being photographed and I have to do a lot of explaining. People will, I get a lot of dirty looks, I get a lot of weird looks and sometimes they ignore me. If you're photographing certain customs like Caporos, uh, people are really angry. They think you're exploiting them. So I have to really get into it, you know, and I just take pictures and have a thick skin, you know, and I show them my pictures. And when I get, sometimes I get uh, questioned very closely and sometimes people get angry. I try to show them my pictures. I tell them my name and I let them look me up. And some of them follow me on Instagram and some of them have unfollowed me on Instagram because of my pictures. Um, here's a, a good question from uh, that Sally's asking. Um, she says, I, I love your work. Um, I, she does street and documentary photography and she's a female too. And she wants to know as a female, how do you protect yourself? Because she can feel danger, especially when she's out late at night shooting. And then 
on that note, she also wants to know how you make money through street photography. Oh boy, that question. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah. First of all, if you are out shooting at night, you need to be damn careful because uh, New York City is different now after COVID. And I am, I go out shooting at night. I hide my camera. I walk around like I own the street and I am going to kill somebody that tries to come up to me. So mm -hmm. you're asking, how do I protect myself? I am very, 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 very aware of my surroundings and I am paranoid, but I have a very good sixth sense and I follow my instincts and my impulses as far as my safety. If I get a bad feeling, I'm out of there. Um, one of the ways you need to stay safe is really taking care of your equipment and not flashing it all the time and maybe tucking. It. I tuck my, my camera. Um, I tape my camera up as I've explained. I really, Katrine, I really wanted to show that camera. It's yeah. not with me right now and <laughs> I meant to have it, um, but it's in the other room. Um, but you know, I walk around like I own the street. I'm not taking any crap from anybody and I get into fights. I mean, there are times when I have to walk away because somebody's going to beat on me and I, I know when I got to go, but I really toe the line. If somebody gives me crap, I am fighting right back. Get away from me. You know, you know, I am really, um, of the street in a lot of ways, you know, um, it can be kind of not real classy you know, the way I act when I have to on the street, you know, you have to sometimes to protect yourself, you have to be very aggressive. As far as making money. And let me say about protecting yourself, you have to use a lot of common sense, you know, I mean, you have to watch what's going on around you. Um, watch your back. As far as making money in street photography, that would be with print sales. Um, it is really impossible with especially with my kind of photography, or, you know, People who shoot like much more mundane looking, I don't want to say mundane, that's not fair, but much prettier street photography, less objectionable, you know, like rain and fog and, you know, snowy pictures that are pretty. Orange they and probably, teal. Yeah, they sell that. That's Instagram stuff. Yeah. That's what Instagram wants. And that's people who are pandering to a certain viewership and who are selling stuff. They're, they're making money that way, maybe. I don't know how much money they're making. But for me... It is really brutal to make money doing this. You are doing this because you love it. It is tough. I have some people who collect my work now and that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of tough, this question came in. Um, how do you deal with the stories of your subjects from impacting you? How do you cope with it all? That's really hard. Um, I've grown a lot more callous than I was, you know, like I, I teared up when I talked about India because the women on Skid Row are really important to me. Um, and when I talked about the gift of the sanitary napkin. So those stories impact me tremendously, but now some of the stuff I'm photographing, I, some, there is some level of disconnection that you have to engage in to photograph people. Look, sometimes you have to be insensitive to photograph sensitivity. So in other words, if I'm gonna be the kind, people will say to me on the street, oh, how could you take that picture? That is so horrible. You are taking a picture of that person and they're homeless and oh, are you gonna give them money? Are you gonna pay them? People say this to me and I'm like, shut up. You know, I have to take this picture because you, excuse me, you just walked past. You didn't buy lunch. You're just walking past, you're just starting a fight with me. You know, quite honestly, to photograph people in difficult circumstances, sometimes you have to be insensitive and you have to like be a bit callous. You know, you really do. I, I find that sometimes I am callous in certain circumstances because if I'm gonna get all upset about everything, then I'm not gonna be able to do this. But I get really angry about a lot of the stuff that I photograph and that's why I do it you know, whether it's an old woman living by herself and abusing cats, or it's, you know, ultimately that's what wound up happening with Jeanette, you know, or a transgendered person who's mentally ill and who never got the care she needed um, a long, long time ago when she needed it. I get really angry about this stuff. So a lot of times it's anger that fuels me. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I do get upset. Sometimes I get upset at my subjects because they're not always perfect people, you know? Um, 
but you do have to develop a measure of callousness, I think, in a way. Well, that's sort of like this. Uh, it sounds like a similar idea of like you know you, you you're you're taking up space on the street. It's like this is my space. I'm here. Get out of my face. It's your in a way you're doing that a lot of times too. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times. So we have a, a question here from from Andrew, who's a student in the program. Um, what are your favorite organizations to work with and that support you um, that you see helping the most or having a real impact in these situations? I don't work with any organizations. I would like mm -hmm. to work with organizations. Um, and that's a, a question of contacts and connections that I'm trying to make, quite honestly, yeah. it's really hard. Um, because there's just so many people out there taking pictures and there's people that have like their little patch of ground that they're not willing to give up. It's really hard to break in. Um, somebody recently introduced my work to someone at UNICEF who liked my work and who is passing it on. I don't know what that means. I would really like to work with them, um, especially for my work in Central America, which I really, really want to get more into. I'm very interested in that, um, especially I won't get into exactly what I'm interested in, but so it is very hard to find organizations to work with, especially when you have a lot of these euphemistic photographers, those photographic euphemisms that I talked about that a lot of yeah. people use. We don't need any more photographic euphemisms. We need to see what it really looks like. We need to you know, educate people and stop mollycoddling people. And so we have to get these organizations to properly recognize images that are a little bit more raw and realistic. Hopefully that it answers the question. Yeah, well, um, and I know it's getting late, but there's two more questions once again on process. Uh, one thing was that someone was interested in that, do you pre-visualize your double exposures or is that more reliant on serendipity? Oh boy, that's all serendipity, that's just, I started doing those because I'm really bored in New York City and I was working with Fujifilm cameras and yep. uh, I just wanted to kind of find a way to record life as it was happening, like minutia. What do you see on the street? I mean, a lot of times it's not some big narrative. It's not some, it's just all these little minute things happening. So I would find a particular image that I liked, for example, a woman with an apple in her mouth, whatever it was. And then I would just... Uh, find a backdrop and that is pure instinct and a lot of like reflex um, because you are using a lot of light and if you've ever used a Fujifilm multiple exposure setting I believe that uh, Canon the R5 has it too yes, it does I want that camera you know for that reason because it's uh, got um, more pixels than you know the crop sensor camera so what you're doing is you're taking a picture and you're fitting things into the light and shadow and it's just it's a lot, a lot, a lot of practice. You can't pre-visualize that. It is just, you never know how it's gonna translate. And um, of, of course, the, the tonality of your image has been addressed. <laughs> and so people wanna know, are you using a filter or, you know, your look, there's like a slightly desaturated look, there's a gritty look. Um, so um, of course, in this program, people are very interested in the image processing. You so let us in on that a little bit. I use all Lightroom. It's all Lightroom, there's no Photoshop. Um, I also, my in-camera settings, I, I tweak my in-camera settings, I tweak my all my saturation, I tweak, there's different, uh, you know, picture profiles yep. in, my, in, in Fujifilm and Sony cameras. I, I shoot with Sony right now, but, and I have a Leica monochrome camera. So there's different picture profiles and I wing it. As I'm out on the street, the light changes on the street. The light changes outside. You know, when I was in Mexico, it was very, very different light. When I'm on the street here, it's really different. So it's constantly changing in my camera. White balance is changing, picture profile, saturation. There's a lot of things I change all the time and I don't even think about it. Um, as far as processing goes, it depends on the picture. You know, Lightroom has different picture profiles. I might add a touch of something here and there and, and reduce the impact. And then I just play with my colors. I just play with my colors. I don't like super saturated tones. I see things differently. I guess I, the way that I work on my images is just the way I see the colors. Mm -hmm. um, 
I can't explain it beyond that. It, it really enlightened me. It was just a lot of experimentation with individual pictures. Right. Well, that's, I really I, I appreciate that how much time you've uh, given us and how many images you've shared and how, how vulnerable you were with us. And I think that everybody that was at this talk today is going to be walking down the street uh, with a, a new eye. Oh. And it's, that's your influence and it's, it's, it's hard, but I think it's very important what you're doing. Well, and we all you. want you to take care of yourself <laughs> as best you can. Um, but I, it's been a wonderful evening and we're, we're so appreciative of your time, your work and your passion. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for listening to me talk because I did talk. I told a couple more stories than I thought I was going to tell. So I really appreciate um, from, from the heart. Thank you. Thank you.